Hi guys and welcome back to another true crime and makeup time video. If you're new here, my name is Zara and I post a new true crime video every single week. So if you love makeup and you love true crime, definitely hit that notification bell button, leave a comment down below saying hi, and definitely, definitely subscribe guys it would mean so much to me. Okay, so today's case was requested by Zealous and thank you so much for requesting this case. And in the comment, I believe you asked me if I knew about this case and the name was so familiar to me. But then when I actually researched it, I was like, oh my God, I know this case and it's crazy. I mean, all the cases we talk about are crazy, but this one is kind of like a mystery of like, who did it? It's very interesting and I feel like if you guys haven't heard of this one before, I think you'll be pretty hooked on it. This is the case of David Cam and the most unimaginable tragedy that happened to his wife and two children. So let's just get into it. So David Ray Cam, he was born on March 23rd, 1964 in New Albany. And I think he was pretty decent looking. He had a very well built body and he also was doing well with the ladies. Let's just say that. He met Kimberly Star Wren in 1984. And when the two of them met, they kind of just fell head over heels for each other. David, at this point, he had already had a previous marriage with his high school sweetheart. And I believe he also had a daughter in that relationship. And when he and Kimberly fell in love, they dated for a little while, but then they eventually got married in 1989. Now, Kimberly believed she was marrying the man of her dreams, the one that she would grow old with and spend her entire life with. And in a way, he was at the beginning. Soon after they got married, David joined the Indiana State Police as a state trooper. And he was very good at his job. He also just kind of looked like a cop. Do you guys you know what I mean? Like there are just some people that just look like that's what they're meant to be. And just a few years into his marriage, like just three, David meets another woman named Stephanie McCarty and she worked at his gym. It was the Fitness Zone Health Club and he was a member there and she worked there and he liked what he saw. The gym is a dangerous place if you're looking because mostly pretty fit, attractive people are there, right? Because what you make at the gym is usually that. And for someone who has a wandering eye, it's probably not the best place to be. Now, at the beginning, it was just a friendship between David and Stephanie. And I mean, I'm sure he was looking for more. But at the beginning, it was just a friendship. And this friendship continued even through the birth of David's child, Bradley. This was David's first son and first child with Kim. And Bradley was born in 1993. And this friendship with Stephanie continued until 1994. So like two years, they remained friends. And I'm guessing they didn't cross that line. Stephanie was also in a relationship during most of that time. And as soon as Stephanie broke up with her boyfriend, David was like wasting no time, jumped in there, asked her out. Now, David did not... He, he was pretty cocky. Let's just say that. He was pretty cocky. He did not even attempt to hide this affair with Stephanie. He took her to dinner, to nightclubs. He even took her to NASCAR races in broad daylight. And during this entire time, while he's rendezvousing with Stephanie, Kim's at home looking after their baby Bradley, their new baby. Great. Now, a couple years later, Kim finds herself pregnant again. And when she announces her pregnancy... Stephanie finds out and she's like, I'm done, David. I don't want to be in this relationship. I mean, you're with a married woman. They break up. Soon after that, they're back together. Now, this time it had been a while. So Kim had this suspicion, and I think most women do. She just had the suspicion that David was fooling around. She confronts him and he says, okay, you got me. I don't want to be in this marriage. Don't worry about the babies I just had with you. It's okay. You deal with these kids. I'm just going to go bone this other woman. Like, okay, David. So at this point, Kim is five months pregnant with her second child and her husband leaves her because he's in love with his mistress. She was obviously heartbroken, but she was like, okay, gotta go. 
figure this out. So she packs up her things and she goes, moves in with her parents. Soon after when she's living with her parents, she's like, hold on, why did I leave? She grabs her things, goes back to the family home and says, David, you get out. I'm staying here. So now David had to figure out a place to live and he's on the phone with his mother and he asks his mom like, hey, can I come live with you? You know, I'm getting kicked out. His mom tells him no. And as he's in the family home, he loses his shit and he starts destroying the family kitchen. And he's on the phone with his mom and his mom's like, calls the police. And she calls the police. The police come. They obviously look at what he's done. But because he works for them, he they keep this incident under wraps and no one finds out about it. So now this marriage is over and Kim and David end up getting their own apartments. Guess who comes and lives with David, even though she's got her own apartment leased? She's living with David. Now, when David's family finds out about this, they are so disgusted with him and they fully support Kim. I mean, she's the mother of his children and he cheated on her, so they better not support David. But they're supporting Kim and they're really disappointed and disgusted in David's behavior. So on February 28th, 1995, Kim gives birth to David and her second child and they named her Jill Cam. And at the birth, David's parents were in attendance and so were Kim's parents, but David didn't show up for the birth, which is just so sad. You feel so sad for these children. Stephanie and David's relation, oh, it's not a relationship, their affair, uh, came to an end in March of 1995 because Stephanie, she agreed to meet her ex-boyfriend at the gym where she worked because she wanted to continue working with him, even though she was having this affair with David. David, when he found out, he was pissed and he already knew this was happening because he was clearly watching her. And when he finds out that she's meeting him, not only is she meeting him, she's also taking a really long time. So he calls her and he demands that she comes home. He's like, come home right now. So when she comes home, they get into an altercation and he pulls out his nine millimeter gun and he like threatens to kill himself. And Stephanie is like, you know, this affair is not going like how I thought it was going to. And she manages to talk him off the ledge. But as soon as he's calmed down and the situation kind of fizzles out, she's like, I'm out of here. And she leaves him. She leaves the apartment as well. Within just a few hours of this taking place, David calls his ex-wife Kim and he apologizes to her and he begs for her forgiveness and says, I love you. I want you back. Now, Kim, she had two children by him. She possibly just didn't want to be a single parent. And she loved David, no matter what he did, she was still in love with him and she forgave him. She agreed to take him back. And both their families were like, wow, I can't believe you forgave him so quickly, but they supported Kim's decision and they were going to support this family. Now, Kim had a great job working with insurance and she made a lot of money. And David at this time, when they rekindled, David uh, left the state troopers and he decided to work with his uncle at his uncle's waterproofing business. Now, David had worked at the police for over 10 years at this point, and he didn't just leave, you know, because he wanted to. He was actually getting a lot of complaints about his behavior and about his wrongdoings at work. So then he finds out that he is now going to be demoted and I think demoted to a desk job. So he was like, no. Nope. Before this even happens, I'm just going to leave and work for my uncle. Also at this waterproofing business with his uncle, David was making way more money and things were just going really well for David and Kim. They also began building their new home, like a dream home, and they wanted a fresh start and it was going really well. So this new home was in Georgetown, Indiana. And when they moved in, things were just going really well exactly how they wanted it. They were pretty happy. Kim was really proud of this new home, but more than that, she was really pleased at David's behavior and how he had begun to change and seemed more in tune with her. Whenever he could, you know, whenever his work allowed him to, he was spending so much more time with their two kids, Bradley and Jill. Now you guys know people can change and happy for them, but what 
Kim didn't know is behind this facade of him being this great dad, this great partner, David was out here in them streets. He hadn't changed. In 1997, he met an old friend named Michelle. Well, I wouldn't even say met because all they did was meet in the back of his car to, you know. Now, when she found out he was married, she quickly ended things, but then he just moves on to the next. He began seeing another woman who actually began, like he met her because she was dating one of his friends, but then that ended because she ended up marrying one of one of his friends and her name was Lisa. And I, these, David is hella messy. So basically he had this pattern of pursuing a woman, attempting to be with her, you know, sometimes he would get the women, but if the woman ever rejected him, he would, he was known to get very angry, but eventually he'd move on from that and then attempt another woman. It was just like a cycle that he, he was a womanizer. At this point, it had been six years since David left Kim, you know, originally to be with his first mistress. And even though he was still doing the same thing in their eyes, things were going well. David had this great job. They were living in this dream house and Kim had a really good job making really good money. But underneath it all, there was trouble brewing because their daughter, Jill, their youngest, began making complaints about feeling pain in her genital area. Now, Jill had come to her mother and told her about this pain and a couple of the other moms in the dance class that uh, Jill attended had witnessed Jill crying and complaining about this pain. And along with that, Jill had even told her grandmother, Kim's mother, about this pain. Now, Kim's best friend's name was Marty McLeod, and she had confided in her best friend, Marty, telling her history is repeating itself, but she never went on to explain what she meant. Lived in Florida, so she invites Kim and says, why don't you come down to Florida and visit me and, you know, we can hang and chat. And Kim actually accepted her offer and said, sure, I will. And, you know, when we, when I come down there, I can explain everything to you much better. And Marty was actually kind of shocked because she was like, wow, Kim's going to actually take the two kids out of school for a week to come down here. Things must really be serious. She must really want to discuss something with me. And she also believed that things possibly were going pretty bad for Kim and David for her to want to do that. Now, this meeting between the two of them would never take place. On Thursday, 28th September in the year 2000, David went to his usual 7 p.m. basketball game. Now, he went to this basketball game every single week um, and he used to go with his friends and it was always from 7 p.m. for a couple of hours and he would come home. That same night, Kim takes Jill and goes to pick up Bradley from his swim class and after that, they were just going to head home. So Kim does this and she gets home around 7.30 p.m., 7.35 p.m., and this is confirmed because a neighbor had actually seen Kim driving into their driveway, pulling into their garage. Around 9.20 p.m., David is on his way home and he's kind of rushing home because he normally wouldn't come home from his basketball games this late. Like, he just knew that Kim was going to be so shitty with him and, you know, he had spent a lot longer than he normally would. The drive from his basketball game to the house was only a five minute drive or so. Now, as he pulls into the garage, he is met with a horrific scene. He sees Kim's car in the garage and he sees Kim lying on the floor in a pool of her own blood. The blood was coming from her head and she was clearly gone. So David is panicking. So he's looking for his children, looks inside the vehicle and he sees Jill she slumped over and she's also clearly gone. And he reaches over Jill to get to Brad because he felt that Brad might still be alive. He pulls Brad out of the car and he begins to perform CPR on Brad, but it didn't do anything. And Brad was also gone. His whole family was dead. Now, because of his previous job, his police training kicks in and he immediately calls the police station and he demands that someone comes to his house immediately. 
He demands to speak with post command and the call, he's hysterical and panicked. He's yelling on the phone, like, get everyone to my house now. He's telling them what's happened, what he sees. And honestly, the call is very, very upsetting. Hey, Nancy, Police Radio, Patrice, can I help you? Patrice, it's Dave Cam. Let me talk to Post Command right now. Okay, he's on another line. Right now, let me talk to Post Command. Hold on. You're my only truth. He then runs over across the road to his neighbor's house and his neighbor was his uncle and he tells his uncle what happened and his uncle is also a state trooper so he rushes back over and his uncle couldn't even believe what he had been seeing and he tries to get David out of the house but he literally had to drag him out of the house because he would not leave. Police arrive fairly quickly and they look at the family members and they determine that they have died from gunshot wounds. The small town that David and Kim lived in were shocked that this crime even took place, that this young woman and her two young children were killed. They didn't have a motive really, but there was some forensic evidence at the scene. And at first they thought it was a robbery gone wrong, but then after looking into it more, they realized this is clearly not even close to a robbery. There were no attempts to break into the house, to even enter the house. And there were no stray bullets anywhere. There were no other, like, you know, um, gunshots. It was literally just the three of them shot and killed. Kim was also found with no pants on. So it looked like that could have perhaps been a motive. Maybe the kids had witnessed something and that's why they had to die too. Something that's really strange about this case and that's talked about a lot, Kim's shoes were also found on top of the vehicle, very neatly placed. Underneath Kim's fingernails, there was DNA found, as well as there was a palm print on the vehicle of the car and the window. A gray sweatshirt was found underneath Brad that had DNA evidence. And although no DNA evidence for this was found, the forensic examiner found that Jill had molested in just a few hours prior to her death. Now because of this, this immediately changed the dynamics of this investigation. Now the detectives were well aware of David's love life. People talked about it a lot. I mean they were witnessing. Now the detectives were well aware of David's love life, his many affairs and they had talked about it a lot when he was still working there it was it was just like a well-known thing and I mean you know men in uniform that's like a thing right like girls find that attractive and it was no different with David it was like a selling point for him right like how many women ask their partners to put on a fireman outfit like that's just a thing right now David being promiscuous isn't surprising but when his entire family ends up dead, these indiscretions of his end up being looked at as a motive for this investigation. It just wasn't looking good. And together with these motives, the couple had also recently upped their life insurance policies. And Kim was aware of this. She signed for it. But these insurance policy increases had literally just taken place a few days before the death of his family. This would form another motive that detectives had to look at. So David is questioned and he goes in being questioned by his own ex-colleagues, people that knew him. And the demeanor and the tone of voice that his colleagues begin to speak to him in starts to become accusatory. 
which is kind of normal. He's an ex-cop. He's being interviewed. And he probably is also more on the defense than a regular person would be because he knows the tactics and the techniques that are being used on him. Now, in regards to Jill's sexual assault or possible sexual assault, um, I forgot to mention earlier that Jill was taken to the doctor and the doctor did note that her privates had some sort of inflammation on them. But he said that this could possibly be due to very aggressive wiping when she was cleaning herself or a reaction to a bubble bath or something like that. Jill is very young. She's four or five at this point. And a family doctor would have to report any abuse that he suspected. And a report was not made, which would assume that he doesn't believe that any abuse was taking place upon examination of her genitals. So that to me is a bit strange. I, For you to see inflammation, like, you know, as a woman, see inflammation, it's, um, I doubt aggressive wipe, I don't know. So investigators, they asked David for his clothing that he wore in the night of the murders and he gives it to them or he, they take it. And then they ask him, okay, well, are you going to provide any DNA? Like, willingly so even though he's angry he says fine and he ends up giving his dna and then he says to the two detectives if this expert puts me in jail then i'm going to come back and kill the two of you being the two detectives now this expert that he was talking about was the head of the forensics unit and this guy when he had come to the crime scene he made a note stating that there was a mop and a bucket that had a very strong smell of bleach coming from it. To him, this meant that this was a sign that someone had tried to clean up the crime scene. He also sees dried white spots in the garage and claims that these are bleach stains. But then later on, he admits that he had made a mistake about these white spots and he was unsure what they were. A set of unidentified fingerprints were found on Kim's car, but she parked in a public spot every single day. So this had to be sort of ruled out because it could be anyone's. Then the strange part about Kim's shoes being placed neatly on top of her vehicle and the detectives were stumped. They were like, who would do this? What type of killer, unless he had a shoe fetish, was going to do that, you know? If it was a killer or if it was a hired hitman, who's going to take the time to put these shoes on the vehicle. It's just a strange thing to do. So they concluded that Kim either drove home with her shoes off and then when she gets out of the car, she puts them on top of the car as she's getting everything else out or the killer had done this as a very personal, intentional act. So then David's clothing. When it was examined, there was a very fine mist of blood splatter found on his shirt. It was so fine that it was nearly invisible to the naked eye. And when they tested this blood, it was found to be Jill's. Then that gray sweatshirt that was found under Brad's body. And David was like, I don't know where this sweatshirt came from. So the prosecution then ends up calling this bloodstain expert whose main job was to assist the prosecution in determining blood splatter that was very difficult to prove. Then when neighbors were interviewed, they claimed that they heard gunshots coming from the home at around 9.20 p.m. Two days later, David Cam was arrested for the murder of his family based on the blood splatter found on his shirt. They believed that his infidelity and his promiscuity was the motive to murder his entire family. So the expert who had been called in to examine the blood splatter determined that that blood stain and that blood splatter would only be possible if a gun was fired, killing each victim at a very close range. So he was guilty. But other expert witnesses testified that that blood splatter on his shirt because it was so fine and so scattered, it had actually come from the moment, you remember he reached over Jill's body uh, to grab Bradley, that that actually, that blood transfer actually happened when he did that because her hair would have splattered the blood onto his shirt. Also, 
it's not funny, but I can't believe these things happen in such high profile cases or just freaking murder cases. This blood splatter expert, okay, that the prosecution was relying on, he was just a crime scene photographer. He was not an expert of anything. The prosecution thought he was an expert. He was a photographer. David, he strongly claimed his innocence. He said, I didn't do it. It wasn't me. So what were the facts discussed at his trial? So David was at his basketball game from 7 p.m. till 9 p.m. And this was corroborated by 11 witnesses who were in attendance. The time of death of his family members was concluded to be at around 8 p.m., although the probable cause affidavit put it down as 9.30 p.m. Now, phone records proved that David had a rock-solid alibi, but the prosecution was determined to just move along to the trial. The DNA on that sweatshirt that was found under Bradley, as well as the DNA found under Kim's fingernails, did not match David's. The palm print that was found on the vehicle also did not match uh, David, and the prosecution sent through all the DNA through to... You know, CODIS, I've mentioned it in my other videos, but CODIS is basically this DNA database. So if they sent this DNA in and it happened to be committed by or belonging to another criminal, it would have like pinged as a match. But CODIS also did not have a match on the DNA. The case went to trial in the year 2002 and what they mainly relied on was this blood spatter evidence. There were eight tiny specks of blood found in a shirt and the prosecution's witness expert not the photographer, but another one, stated that this blood spatter could have only occurred if David was the one who shot his family. That this type of blood spatter would only occur if a gun had been fired at close range. Over a dozen women who had had affairs with David were brought in to further prove that this was David's motive for the crime. So now what about those 11 people that are corroborating that he was at the basketball game? Well, the prosecution's theory was that, well, these 11 people are either lying or, yes, David was at the game, but he ducks out, drives the five minutes to his family home, kills his family, drives the five minutes back to the game, and then continues to play basketball. There was also a phone call made from David's home phone at about 7, 19 p.m., and it was like a, it was a work phone call, and if this phone call took place, they are stating that David would have been home when Kim came home with the kids. They said the crime scene was staged by David, that he was the one that removed Kim's pants to make it seem like someone had broken into the home. Also, they stated that his daughter, Jill's injuries or condition of her genitals was consistent with that of sexual assault, even though her doctor stated that it was due to inflammation. Then they relied on that call that Kim made to her best friend, which in which he said history was repeating itself. David was into other women. He was a cheater. He didn't want to live this life with his wife and kids. He was a bad guy. An ex-cop who knew the ropes. He was a dirty, hornbag guy abusing his own daughter he did not want this life and he killed his family and the DNA evidence on him proved it. The defense had their other theory that the blood spatter found on David was from him reaching over his daughter to attempt to save his son and that her hair had um, spread this blood spatter on him and it wasn't caused by him killing them. Also, the defense was like, um, it's going to be highly impossible for someone to shoot three people at close range and only get eight tiny, almost naked to the eye blood spatter stains on him. They also presented evidence that there was other DNA at the scene that did not match David, the palm print and, and the DNA under Kim's nails. Additionally, they argued that, okay, yes, David cheated, but none of the affairs that testified or affairs that he had were even ongoing and active during the time that the murder took place. So what was his motive? The affair with Stephanie, the one woman that he was in love with, took place six years prior. The injuries that were on his daughter were not caused by David. The defense also stated that the prosecution's theory of David 
going to the basketball game, leaving the basketball game, coming home, killing his family, and then going back to the basketball game was dumb. The prosecution then calls in their own expert, a phone expert, who stated that that phone call that David made at 7.19 p.m. was actually incorrect. It had taken place at 6.19 p.m. and the times were mixed up due to the time zone difference. And David didn't deny this phone call taking place. He says he made this phone call right before he left the game prior to 7 p.m. and the timestamp matched. It was 6.19 p.m. More importantly, there were 11 people at the game who confirmed seeing David at the game the entire time and that he only left to go home at about 9.20 p.m. And the prosecution also stated, well, someone had cleaned up the crime scene. It had been cleaned up. There was evidence to show that. But then that was also proven to be incorrect because the flow in which the blood was flowing in, they stated, was occurring because of it being exposed to air and water, and that was just the, the direction it was flowing in. Next was the sweatshirt. And the sweatshirt that was found, the um, defense is like, well, whose sweatshirt is it? It had the word backbone written on it and it wasn't David's. It had never been in the home before. And that was just ignored. The prosecution was just like, anyways, moving on. Keeping in mind, there was DNA found on that sweatshirt. So not long after, on March 17th, 2002, David Cam was found guilty on all three counts of murder and he was sentenced to 195 years in prison. He quickly filed an appeal stating that it was an unfair trial because the admission of evidence of all his affairs that had taken place had nothing to do with the trial and he believed it was not, it was not a fair trial due to this. In August of 2004, the Supreme Court actually agreed with David and overturned his conviction. The prosecutor Keith Henderson was so determined to pin this murder on David, he believed David was guilty. He wanted to seek justice for the Cam family and thought that he was doing the right thing. So before his second trial, there would be new evidence that would come to light that would change everything. Three years later, in 2005, the defense learns that, you know, that sweatshirt with the DNA, DNA on it, they said it, you know, it had been sent to CODIS and no matches were ever found. Well, they found out that nothing was sent to CODIS. It was never submitted. And I think that's so strange. Like, was it intentionally done? Was it an accident? But after obtaining a court order to compel the prosecution to send this DNA through to the FBI, it was finally done. This DNA was put in to CODIS and they found a match, guys. The DNA matched a convicted felon by the name of Charles Boney. Now, Charles had recently been released from prison and he admitted that the sweatshirt they found at the crime scene was his. However, it wasn't that simple. He claims that he had donated the sweatshirt to the Salvation Army and he has no idea how it came to be at the David, I mean, at the Cam residence. He was never at the home. He never touched any of the victims and he had nothing to do with it. His convictions in the past had to do with um, him committing several armed attacks on women. Now, in these attacks, he focused on shoes and he admitted he had a shoe fetish. He was nicknamed the Shoe Bandit and he had abducted three women at gunpoint, kidnapped them and harassed women. He, he was not a good guy. So the police were like, okay, let's give him a polygraph test. And he took this test and he was found to be ding, 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 deceptive. So then the palm print on the vehicle was an identical match to Charles's. So then he was arrested. Later, his DNA was found in all these places. It was found on Kim and Jill, on Kim's underwear, on her broken fingernails, on the arm of Kim's shirt, and on Jill's shirt. Then it was also found that Charles was out on parole during the time the murders took place. Kim also had bruising on her feet. And remember her shoes were found neatly placed on top of the car. So all these signs pointed to Charles. Now, long story short about that DNA on the sweatshirt, the prosecution claims that they actually ran this DNA, but it came up with no match. But clearly that was a lie. Now, apparently at the time of the first trial, David's first trial, the lead prosecutor was actually representing Charles Boney 
in another separate trial. And Charles actually discussed David's case with the prosecutor at the time. And the prosecutor allegedly told him, yeah, it doesn't really look good for you. So they purposely, allegedly, sent the wrong DNA to CODIS. Now, Charles was clearly at the crime scene as the evidence obviously proved. And he came up with numerous theories, which he would, well, maybe it, you know, came here because I donated that shirt and things like that. He was just lying and proven to be lying each time. Finally, he settles on this theory that he had gone to David's house to sell David a gun. He then claims that David took the gun that he was trying to sell him and killed his entire family while Charles was still inside the house. After killing his family, he then threatens Charles, don't talk or I'm going to kill you too. But no phone records could ever even confirm that Charles and David had talked before the murder took place. And obviously, if they had found this evidence, it would kind of corroborate Charles's um, story. But then Charles changed it to, well, it was a chance meeting. And then he states that when he was fleeing David, okay, he was fleeing through the garage, is when he tripped over Kim's shoes as he was fleeing, but he stopped to pick up the shoes and place them on top of the car because, you know, he's a good guy. So that's why the shoes were placed on top of the car. So the DNA that was found on that sweatshirt that was there, there was also another set of DNA found, which was Charles's girlfriend. And so she's brought in for questioning. She claims that on the night of the murder, Charles, he, he comes home. And when he came home, he was breathing super heavy. He showed her a gun and that he was bleeding from a scraped knee. She also stated that as the coverage of the murders was taking place on the news, Charles was super interested in all the details. She just full. Bye, Charles. <laughs> I'm going to snitch on you. So then, okay, we're thinking, all right, okay, David's acquitted. But no, no, no. Charles and David both get charged together as co-conspirators. David must have been like, what is going on? So Charles's trial takes place first and he is found guilty pretty much immediately. Three counts of murder and he is sentenced to 225 years in prison. David's trial then goes on in January of 2006 and Charles testifies against David. So during his second trial, the evidence of all the affairs that David had would be inadmissible and the prosecution now comes up with another theory. Okay, let's talk about it. The medical examiner now states that the wounds that Jill had on her genitals were consistent with that of S.A. She was five years old and now their theory was David was conspiring with Charles to murder his family to prevent Jill from coming forth and revealing the abuse that she had suffered at the hands of her father that he inflicted on her. Then another medical examiner testifies that Jill's hymen was intact and the damage to her private areas were occurred at the time of the attack from blunt force trauma. That's what they were showing consistent signs with. The defense also argued that the prosecution could not prove that Jill was even abused and that David was the one who had done it to her. The defense was banned from even discussing or introducing Charles, Charles's history of uh, SA, even though it's so relevant to the crime, but they were not allowed to talk about it. The defense pointed blame at Charles and stated that he and he alone attacked and murdered the Cam family. On March 6, 2006, David once again is found guilty of murdering his family. He was sentenced to life in prison again for the second time, and he again appealed his conviction. This time, David appealed on the grounds that this trial was also unfair because they introduced the motive of the crime as David molesting his daughter. However, during the trial, there was not a single shred of credible evidence that was introduced. Therefore, there was no motive. So the trial, he was tried unfairly again. The appellate court agreed once again and David's conviction again was overturned. To everyone's shock, the prosecutor, Keith, 
try to try David for a third time. This time, however, the defense learned that this prosecutor, he actually was in talks about writing a book and getting this book published where he would talk about the David Cam case. He allegedly even had a contract in the works and this was a huge conflict as he had financial gain now and financial interest in this trial. For this reason, a new prosecutor was assigned to the trial and Keith, he lost his contract and his book deal when he wasn't <laughs> the prosecutor anymore. So how convenient. Now, during the third trial, remember how I mentioned before that the prosecution relied on this blood spatter expert, but he turned out to be the photographer, the crime scene photographer. Well, that wasn't even revealed until this third trial. So I kind of spoiled it earlier, but that's what happened at this third trial. The prosecution believed that he was a expert and during his testimony, he admitted during this trial that he had lied on the stand on the previous two trials. I cannot believe that. I mean, I'm glad he at least admitted to it, but like, I didn't find out. I couldn't find out if he actually got in trouble. Like what happened? He just got away with it. Additionally, I guess evidence was now coming out that Charles Boney's DNA was found under the fingernails of both Kim and Jill. And I don't know why that wasn't found out before. I mean, why is everything coming out so slowly? It's not like it's the 1980s. It's fairly recent, 20 years ago, sort of. This time, the state cannot accuse David of molesting his daughter because there's no evidence. So to counter this, the prosecution provides yet another theory, okay? They now claimed that David killed his entire family because of a life insurance scam. He was said to collect $750,000 in life insurance, and that was the motive for the murders. Oh my gosh, like every trial, there's a different motive. It's, it's crazy how much they're hounding him. It seems like they already had the perpetrator, Charles. But I guess what was Charles's motive? A shoe fetish? Shoe bandit? So many years later, on October 24th, 2013, David was acquitted on all charges. And there are mixed feelings about this. There are some people who believe that he's 100% guilty and then there are some people who are like, no, he's so innocent. He had nothing to do with it. After this case, allegations of police misconduct came out with, you know, witness tampering and evidence tampering. It was just all a big mix up. And was it intentional? Charles not being investigated properly, the wrong evidence being sent through, the prosecution having this book deal and, you know, financial gain. David also sued the county and ended up settling for $450,000, which if he is guilty, that is not enough money to put him through all of that for that many years. Kim's parents, however, sued David for her life insurance money and her 401k because they believe that David is guilty. Charles Boney, he is still behind bars and he maintains his innocence, even though he's facing 225 years behind bars and his DNA was the only one found at the crime scene. Now, if we're going solely based off evidence, the evidence clearly shows that Charles was the one present at the crime scene and possibly guilty of killing three members of the Cam family. But evidence can be placed, right? But can it be placed under fingernails? The jury found that the evidence does not support a guilty verdict for David. And David spent 13 years fighting for his innocence. And if he is innocent, which... I think he is. I hope he spent or got some time to grieve the loss of his wife and his two children. This case clearly demonstrates the importance of thorough investigation and integrity of law enforcement. The lack of investigation almost allowed a killer to walk free and an innocent man to be put into jail. And I wonder what was Charles's motive. Sometimes the prosecution just doesn't know when to quit and the mix-up or neglect in this blood spatter evidence was really an embarrassment to forensic science. They say that blood spatter is an investigative tool and it's not a science and shouldn't be relied upon as hard evidence and presented in court as fact. 
Also, there's so much nitty gritty information in this case. And if I miss something, I'm sure I did, please feel free to leave it in the comments below. Also, my brain is not really at the highest functioning level right now. I'm getting like six hours of sleep. No, six hours of sleep. I wish I'm sleeping for six hours in bed, but I'm getting like four. But I don't know what I think. I don't think David did it. I don't think that he wanted to kill his family. I think, yeah, he wanted to fool around. He was getting away with it. I don't know if he needed to kill them. It doesn't seem like money was a motive because they were both doing really well. Also, if this neighbor saw Kim drive up to the house at 7.30, if she saw Kim drive into the drive uh, into the garage, she would have seen whether David's car was there or not. And at this time already, 11 witnesses have stated that he was already at the game. But Charles, I mean, he's adamant that David was the one that killed his family. And it's weird if David wasn't at all because now Charles, I mean, the last thing I read, Charles was saying that he saw David shoot his family. If David wasn't involved, he really went through over a decade of horror. He wasn't the best husband, clearly, but was he a killer? I also find it really weird how hard the prosecution fought to convict David, especially if the police, he was their colleague at one point. So did they just really hate him or did they really believe that he was the one who did it? He was the one with the motive. I mean, usually it is the family member, usually. Charles is a weird, he did, like, what did Charles do this for? It's so strange. And it's also weird that Charles just randomly came up to this house. Like, was he targeting them? He didn't even live close by. It, it is a weird conviction to that Charles was actually like his DNA was actually found because it's just so random, but who knows what to think because everything in this case is so botched and so messy. It's hard to really know. Let me know your thoughts on today's case down below guys. What do you think? I hope you enjoyed today's video and I will see you in the next one guys. Besitos. Bye.